Hi, I'm Joe Quirk, president of the Seasteading Institute and co-founder of Blue Frontiers. I want to tell you about our semi-autonomous floating islands in paradise, the first practical step towards seasteading. But first, you probably want to know why. I'm from San Francisco, a city with so much innovation and so much wealth. And so many tech geniuses migrate here to create the future. Naturally, it's the most well-governed city in the best governed state in the most excellently governed country in the world. Wrong! When I get off that floating city and get on that land city, my cost of living goes up. My chances of being mugged, panhandled, ticketed, and taxed all go up by orders of magnitude. Why is the floating city better? That priesthood has a special governing framework that borrows best practices from around the world. And they are not the first. Seasteading is an emergent phenomenon that occurs on blue frontiers all over the globe. So we can begin this story among the thousand islands of ancient Greece, ancient Greece. Each established their own political system, each competed to attract residents, which produced a glorious civilization that the West has been emulating for two and a half thousand years. We can begin in Venice, a startup society founded on the water, which was among the kingless, self-governing city-states that kicked off the Italian Renaissance, and produced so many innovations in finance and art, Western civilization has been imitating them ever since. But I'm going to start the story of seasteading in 2004. You see that little yellow dot? Those are the Marquesas Islands, part of French Polynesia, where this gentleman, Pascal Erhel Hatuuku, proposed that Western civilization and Polynesian civilization co-create floating islands to allow people to organically adapt to sea level change. And this was the same year that his country signed the Statute of Autonomy, which empowers French Polynesia to create special economic zones. Four years later, in 2008, Robert Ballard, who discovered the Titanic, he's been called Carl Sagan with gills, gave a famous TED talk where he concluded with this clarion call. Why are we not looking at moving out onto the sea? Why do we have programs to build habitations on Mars, but we do not have a program looking at how we colonize our own planet and the technology is at hand? That same year, Two Silicon Valley entrepreneurs and technologists, Peter Thiel and Patry Friedman, co-founded the Seasteading Institute to bring a startup sensibility to the problem of government monopolies that are too big to succeed. Patry Friedman, a Google engineer, observed that Steve Wozniak didn't change Hewlett Packard from within. After his design for the personal computer was rejected, five times, he left and founded Apple with Steve Jobs. So, where will the Wozniaks of governance go? Patry proposed that if we have a startup sector for governance and people can vote with their houses, we could replace monopolies on government with a market of governance, and voila, we'd solve one of the deepest social challenges at the very root of society. Seasteaders want to tell investors, forget startup companies. How would you like to found your own startup country? Just, just one little challenge. The, the technology, it's, it's a little expensive. So, uh, you know, a billion just to get started. And even Peter Thiel was like, this is too eccentric. You're a research institution. Go figure it out. Well, of course, it's unreasonable to ask investors to make that big a jump. The way to do this 
is to start selling a minimal viable product and scale up. Meanwhile, across the world in the Netherlands, the world leaders in environmentally sustainable floating real estate, Karina, Rutger, and Bart from Blue 21, had already built the floating pavilion in Rotterdam. It's entirely sustainable, it runs on solar, it recycles all its water, and it's not expensive in shallow waters. So I was deputized to co-write the seasteading book, and I went out and found the book written by the co-founder of the company that built this, Rutger de Graaf, and I was astonished to read the following paragraph. How could a floating city be governed? Over the last decades, there has been a shift from top-down hierarchical steering government towards more network-driven, decentralized forms of policymaking with multiple actors, governance. Floating cities offer an opportunity to take this development a step further by using the opportunities that decentralized technologies offer. Floating cities on the ocean would constitute their own state and become members of international organizations such as the United Nations. Wow! An engineer in the Netherlands independently thought of seasteading, and he's actually built something currently in use. And that's when Randolph Hankin initiated the Great Pivot. In 2013, Randy was executive director of the Seasteading Institute, and he realized that in order for seasteading to happen in 2020 instead of 2050, and to do it for millions instead of billions, we need to combine a governance technology that already works on land with an engineering technology that already works on the water. The challenge is that shallow waters are all controlled by existing nations. So how do we achieve some measure of political autonomy for our floating islands? We go to countries that already host legal islands. Check out my podcasts with Lada Moberg and Tom W. Bell who are leading experts in special economic zones, which to me are little legal islands created within countries, allowing special exemptions from taxes and regulations. Our strategy was find a coastal nation which already has special economic zones, and we propose an extra special economic zone, and we don't even need land. We'll bring our own land. If we fail, that's on us. If we succeed, we share in the prosperity. So the great search for a host nation began. And seasteaders dreamed of a magical nation that would fulfill all our requirements. We needed a beautiful, safe, stable country. That crossed half the countries off our list. Shallow, calm seas with a variety of natural wave breakers so we can start scaling up. That crossed another three quarters off the list. We needed government leaders who understand the power of small incremental steps towards, towards autonomy. And that crossed another three quarters of countries off the list. And most of all, we needed a population who wouldn't think seasteaders were crazy. And right when I started to worry that that crossed every country off the list, Mark W. Collins reached out to us and told us we need a marine culture with a history already friendly to switching among islands and founding new societies. So Mark Collins is the Tahitian visionary who saw the whole thing in his mind. He's lived in Silicon Valley. He's lived in Mexico. In Tahiti, he's a businessman and he's served in the government as Minister of Tourism, and he's cultivated relationships all over the Pacific and in France, and Mark should write a second book uh, about seasteading from a Polynesian perspective. It's fascinating. And here's my perspective from my bedroom just a few months ago. 
So seasteading is about to start in the most beautiful place on Earth, in some of the calmest waters on the ocean, and among some of the warmest, most welcoming people in the world. It's so heartfelt, we don't even have a word to describe it. It's called mana. It evolved among islands, and everybody who arrives feels it. So let me tell you a story. In 1960, this English gentleman crashed his boat into Tahiti. He fell in love with a girl, and he decided never to fix his boat. He sold his story to British newspapers, and people paid him just to read about it week after week. Why? For centuries, Tahiti had been legendary for being an unreachable paradise where European sailors would stop off and then refuse to leave. It was a siren song. Captains would lose their crew. The real story of the mutiny on the bounty is largely driven by this. Crew members saying, abandon me here. I've found happiness and I'm never leaving. Nearly six decades after he crashed his boat into Tahiti, Roger and Juliet run a restaurant on the water. A few years ago, the gal Roger left behind ran into him at a party and said, you son of a bitch. How did she find him? Today, the country has 53 airports. It took me seven and a half hours to fly to Tahiti from LA. Amazon Prime orders three, uh, offers three-day shipping to Tahiti. So we arrive, and Mark had everything scheduled, and the first day we met with, listen to this, the government minister of the blue economy and economic recovery. His title describes seasteading, and the next day he announced to the country he liked the project, and within months he would be Vice President Teva Rofrich. Over the next 10 days, Mark took us on a whirlwind tour of leading research centers and businesses, and all these Tahitians would become our partners. So at the end of the trip, we were invited to the presidential palace to meet with uh, President Edward Fritch and his cabinet and several mayors of islands, and 10 seasteaders gave a two-hour presentation about the legal engineering and business innovations we plan to bring to French Polynesia. And when we were done, President Fritsch said, let's build the future together. Here is President Fritsch shaking hands with our superstar of strategy, Nicolas Germaneau. For every person like me who's out there blathering about seasteading, there are several people behind the scenes actually making it happen. Uh, my other angel in white is Greg Delon, founder and CEO of Urban Innovation Exchange Global, and he's brought a whole community to seasteading that would never understand us otherwise. And so a few months later, government ministers flew to San Francisco, and year one of the Aquatic Age began in January when we signed our historic Memorandum of Understanding agreeing to a special governing framework. That same day, we announced Blue Frontiers, a startup company collaborating with the Seasteading Institute. These are five co-founders and our first three staff. On the left, beneath the French flag, you see our pillar of law, Tom W. Bell, who conceived the C-Zone and has a lot more legal innovation up his sleeve. On the right, next to the French Polynesian flag, you see our engineer of the sustainable floating pavilion in Rotterdam, Bart Rofen. This is what Bart designed for French Polynesia based on a local flower to honor the Polynesian culture. Blue Frontiers will create an environmentally sound, self-sustaining, modular floating islands with significant regulatory autonomy so people can experiment with societies founded on 21st century values instead of 18th century values. French Polynesia is concerned they may lose a third of their islands by the end of this century. 
Floating islands could be big business in the years ahead. Boom! And that's when the great acceleration began. Just this past May, we co-hosted the first Tahitian seasteading gathering in 2017. Nearly 100 international guests flew in from 17 countries. The tickets to this conference weren't cheap, but Tahitians were welcomed in for free because we wanted complete transparency. The conference was live cast. Anyone in the world could watch any of these 34 speeches on any subject, and we're uploading each talk onto YouTube. And after the conference, we hosted two days of workshops where Tahitians could come ask any questions they want. Dozens of companies sponsored the event. Look at these partners. Air Tahiti Nui, their local airline, sponsored our flights to the conference. Pascal Erhu Hatuuku, the original seasteader, volunteered to MC the conference, and he never even told anyone. He was the guy who proposed Floating Islands in 2004. He just presided over this event, and he messed with our heads. If you can see the slide behind him, he's poking fun at Polynesians, who are so happy they're responding to sea level rise by partying and playing music on the bottom of the ocean. And Pascal looks like a Polynesian warrior, and he uses his size for humorous effect. So here he's pacing the stage, warning the speakers about how he will enforce time constraints. And when speakers got to the one minute mark, he'd march up to the stage and he'd bang his club. And we were like, Jesus, who is this guy, Mark? And Mark just smiled, he didn't say anything. And when Pascal got up to speak, all of a sudden he drops the Polynesian knowledge. And he showed how traditional Polynesian technology and modern Western technology evolved many similar concepts in parallel. And I want to quote from it. He said, we Polynesians are the people of the sea, the first seasteaders. And it's true. Polynesians sailed from island to island, founding new societies, sparking an evolutionary process that created many technologies based not on explicit knowledge, but implicit knowledge, which they call mana. I was told that the main motivation for moving was discontent. So when the West was seasteading in ancient Greece, the Pacific navigators were seasteading in the Marquesas Islands. Venice has 118 islands. French Polynesia has 118 islands. The parallels are compelling. Polynesians are intimately familiar with special governing frameworks that float. And why should special governing frameworks just visit paradise when they can stay in paradise? Cruise ships are a one-way service, cruise ship to the consumer. Floating islands will be peer-to-peer -peer businesses, engaging network effects. So you can get creative. You guys are aquapreneurs. Seastead flag registry, uh, drone food delivery, marine robotics lab. Tahitian coasts are some of the most valuable coasts in the world. We create more coasts. Here's how Blue Frontiers is going to make money. One, sell or lease real estate that we create. Two, what I like to call C Combinator, take a stake in companies who want to be a part of this nano nation accelerator. Three, intellectual property as we develop the technology for going to the high seas. And now that Bart Rofen has investigated our protected calm lagoon in Tahiti, Bart discovered that you can make these islands much smaller and much cheaper than you see here. This is our minimal viable product for freedom. Our floating islands are expected to be approximately 25 meters by 25 meters for roughly 5 million each, housing up to 30 residents or a single family. Bart designed this to be an aquarium restaurant seating 100 patient, uh, patrons. 
uh, and the platforms can be environmentally restorative and increase sea life. This is the construction process that was overseen by Bart when he managed the floating pavilion in Rotterdam. These platforms are designed to last more than a century in seawater. For our pilot project, we plan to develop about 12 small floating islands hosting between 200 and 300 people. We're working with several architects who are designing workspaces, hotels, maker spaces, I want to see schools and class trips teaching students about the blue economy. We plan to be about one kilometer from shore, tethered to the seafloor 20 to 40 meters deep. Blue 21 is going to use state-of-the-art monitoring technologies to study turbidity, heavy metals, dissolved oxygen, and the platforms will increase the amount of sea life. Imagine if you could restore coral reefs simply by the presence of your floating platform. Bart and Karina devised a plan to position the platforms to create some shadows to lower temperatures just enough to spark the restoration of the corals. This is way beyond sustainability. On the ocean, we can build environmentally restorative communities. By 2020, this lagoon in Tahiti will be home to the first free-floating islands, featuring a range of regulatory innovations in labor, immigration, fintech, biotech, medical, and it's not just the lagoon. Prosperity and pride for Polynesians. Listen to this. We requested a 99-year lease for about 100 acres of premium beachfront real estate to be administered under the same jurisdiction as the sea zone. That's about half a square kilometer of virgin territory. Look at all those lagoons. French Polynesia's only international golf course is right across the way and we expect to start building in 2018. We're going to start very small and non-threatening. This is Blue 21's brand new plan for vegetation roofs. You are the first to see it. We plan to use recycled plastic and glass. We plan to build with local coconut fiber, local wood, bamboo, and incorporate traditional Polynesian art and culture in the design. If you move there, you will have a view like this from your bedroom. We're, we've already raised our seed round, which we're using to fund the future. Uh, this is what we're going to to make sure every stakeholder is happy. We hired a French law firm, GB2A, to research our seed zone. And just a few weeks ago, they delivered a 150-page document saying the sea zone is resting on solid legal ground, so it might as well float. 150 pages. You got a legal problem? Come at me, bro. I'm slightly biased, but we did our best to hire a disinterested party. Uh, so this is John Hawkins of EMSI, uh, a respectable economic modeling firm. He's not a seasteader. He's a straight shooter. And here he's presenting presenting his preliminary report live at our Tahitian seasteading gathering. It was also uh, presented privately to the government. He estimates that just in phase one, during the first two years of construction, the floating islands could create or support more than 600 jobs, pay out more than 23 million in wages each year, make more than 120 million in sales during construction, and generate more than 7 million in tax revenue for French Polynesia each year, and I'm rounding down. As part of our overall funding strategy, Blue Frontiers is in the final stages of validating a token sale. Over the last several months, our team of lawyers and consultants have been completing due diligence, 
We've taken into account the recent comments by the Securities and Exchange Commission, as well as the Monetary Authority of Singapore, where Blue Frontiers is incorporated. We will be announcing more details in the very near future. Sign up for our mailing list to be among the first to learn about it. Go to Blue Frontiers with a hyphen. Blue Frontiers is not just decentralizing finance. We will decentralize the very ground beneath our feet. People will be able to vote with their houses with interchangeable modules. As our Venice on the Pacific prospers and grows, it will leave the lagoon and go out into deeper waters. At each baby step, each seastead will absorb the cost of failure, but prosperity is shared locally. The Polynesian voyaging canoe was called the Va'a, and this is Va'a 2.0. If the sea zone makes French Polynesians proud, we will propose the next step in legal innovation and how much space does French Polynesia have to experiment with sea zones? French Polynesia controls an area of ocean the size of Western Europe. This is the new blue continent. Compare that to the size of the United States. The 2004 Statute of Autonomy designates French Polynesia as an overseas country inside the Republic. France is basically in charge of defense, police, courts, and currencies. Sea zones, that's French Polynesian's call. Mark and Pascal have initiated this. Pascal recommends you read my book with Patry Friedman, or he will get his club. Our good fortune suffers from the burden of too many people to thank. Blue Frontiers has more than 50 volunteers working in 12 working groups, and the caliber of people devoted to this project is beyond my capacity to describe. If you want to join our growing community, go to Blue Frontiers with a hyphen. The journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. This is my friend, Adam Dick, a seasteading engineer who experiments with floating materials. Unlike Adam, I don't trifle with actual practical details. I'm in charge of the grand vision of the future. So for dessert, thank you for listening. I'm going to give you my timeline from 2020 to 2050, the prophecy of the future by Quirkstradamus. My colleagues will tell you they take no responsibility for anything I say. 2020, everybody is disappointed, especially our critics. What? I don't see Dennis Hopper. Oh. Let's go complain about some other aspect of freedom. Meanwhile, unbeknownst to them, its most unique feature is the sea zone, fostering maximum business freedom, sparking innovation. <laughs> That's the sound of me rubbing my hands together. 2021, media attention, ecotourists, Blue Frontiers Theater of the Performing Arts, lectures by marine biologists and Polynesian navigators. If you look closely, you can see Tom W. Bell explaining the sea zone. 2022, as you dine on local cuisine, observe the tropical sea life fostered by our floating islands. Look at the restored coral reef while we hand you this gigantic bill. 2024, Convention Center. Platforms 3D printed from calcium carbonate and sand with walkways the color of coral. Onshore, entrepreneurship among Tahitians who hire their neighbors. 2025, Simon Nummy's vision. Rooftop gardens, solar halos, carbon credits, wind power, homes raised on pillars above the waves. Anchoring system dampens the waves, pumps cold, nutrient-rich water 
to the surface for aquaculture. Sea-cooled data centers, biofuel production, 2030 algae-based economies. Blue Frontiers secures legislation for the next step beyond the sea zone, what Tom W. Bell calls the deep blue zone, a special area of international waters designated within territorial waters, unprecedented in history. Coastal nations reach out to Blue Frontiers, asking for help with sea level rise in exchange for some political autonomy. Seasteading begins in Palau, the Maldives, Panama, Monaco, Dubai, Japan. The nations of the world organize to save sinking Kiribati with floating islands. Not technically difficult. Seamounts 300 feet below the surface. French Polynesia has every stepping stone to free seas. Pascal's home, the Marquesas Islands, has more seamounts than islands. Tens of thousands of seamounts in international waters, thousands of Venices, people voting with their houses. 2033, the Venice of the Pacific. It's beautiful. In Emerson Steps vision, companies and communities demand their own startup nano nations. Most of the mass of this is below the ocean. Miniature submarines can be lowered to taxi residents to other locations. 2040, a beach is the most effective wave break. A flexible hammock supports sand, vertical farms, underwater sports stadium. Your bedroom looks out on an aquarium. This is the vision of Tyler Creshover. This is called Metropolis 2055. Today's toddlers in their early 30s with a variety of governance options available to them. The larger the city, the more stable in waves, incentivizing improved governance to attract more modules. Seasteads engage the fluid mechanics of voluntary societies. Read all about it in the Seasteading Bible, and thank you for listening, and I'll see you on the Blue Frontier.